So good morning, everyone. Good morning. Looks like there's students. Good morning. Um, by now, you all know that I am Marjorie Rollins and the Executive Director for the Health Data Standards Program at Regan Street Institute. Welcome again to Atlanta and welcome to day three of the conference. We've had an incredible three days with exceptionally interesting and thoughtful sessions. I would say often with lively and spirited debate, which is actually a good thing because that demonstrates engagement, which is necessary to drive change. So our schedule today is a little different um, than it was on the previous days. We have an exciting plenary or keynote, um, and we'll hear from Dr. Julie Skapik, and I'll introduce Dr. Skapik in a minute. Um, we're also excited to discuss our collaboration work with SNOMED International. Um, this session will be in a town hall format, and our SNOMED colleagues are here to join us in that discussion. And after lunch, we'll have our Lloyd committee meetings. And following those committee discussions, we'll move into our closing plenary. And now, I'm pleased to introduce today's keynote speaker, Dr. Julia Skapik. You should know that uh, there is a group of us, including many of you in this room today who've been on this long and arduous journey to promote the adoption and use of standards, uh, interoperability, and health information exchange. And Dr. Skapik has been at the very center of that work. Um, and I'd like to tell you more about her. She is the Chief Medical Information Officer at the National Association of Community Health Centers, also known as NACHC. And she was previously a senior medical informatics officer at the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT. Um, Dr. Skafik has a breadth of expertise working in the public and private sector on um, health IT interoperability, governance and clinical content and clinical decision support at NACHC. Uh, she supports health IT stakeholder coordination and engagement, data definitions, measurement harmonization, the NAC NACHC, what's the, what's the short first? The NAC Data Warehouse and its governance framework, and health IT enabled quality improvement, care coordination, and patient and care team engagement. She is also the chair elect of the HL7. Uh, International Board of Directors, and she's member of the HL7, a member of the HL7 Europe Board of Directors. She received a BA in biology from New College of Florida, a master's degree in public health from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and a medical degree from the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Julia Scavin. It's like, oh no, it's the long bio. Um, so thank you so much for having me. Uh, today I wanted to talk about health equity and community health centers, sort of not wearing my standards hat so much, <laughs> because I think actually it's an area that most of you are probably unfamiliar with, not the health equity part maybe, but community health centers. And I would want to invite all of you at your respective organizations to consider how you could partner with federally qualified health centers um, to move health standards and equity forward. Um, so this is the NAC mission. Um, the National Association of Community Health Centers was founded in 1971, so we had our 50th birthday during the pandemic, uh, to promote efficient, high-quality, comprehensive health care. It's accessible, culturally and linguistically competent, community-directed, and patient-centered for all. 
These are NAC's six strategic pillars. Um, the first is equity and social justice, and I'll talk about the history of the community health center movement in a minute. Second is empowered infrastructure that very much um, speaks to our use of data and our use of electronic health records and other tools. Um, supporting skilled and mission-driven workforce. Uh, workforce has been a big challenge in the last few years and community health centers spend about a quarter as much as the typical healthcare organization providing primary care. So um, paying for that staff is a challenge for us. Uh, reliable and sustainable funding, improved care models. Uh, community health centers are involved heavily in value-based care work and supportive partnerships. That's where all of you come in and hopefully you can talk to me after this. So the community health center movement was actually founded in the civil rights movement. And Dr. Robert Smith formed the Southern Branch of the Medical Committee for Civil Rights in 1963 as a protest against the American Medical Association, which allowed Southern medical societies to remain segregated. And um, this gentleman here in the bottom corner uh, was actually the subject of the movie Doc Hollywood. Uh, he did. He was traveling to uh, set up a cardiology practice and found himself instead practicing family medicine in Southwest Georgia. So if you've seen that movie, uh, that's sort of a, a take on that true story. Um, these are the first two community health centers, uh, one founded uh, uh, in Louisiana, the Delta Health Center, and one founded in Boston in a, um, next to a public housing community. Uh, and America's health centers owe their existence to um, the turn of events around the civil rights movement. And the first health centers are now uh, 58 years old. Both of these uh, still exist. So what is a health center? So um, we work both with lookalike health centers, which are those that are not federally qualified, but the vast majority of health centers are federally qualified. And to be an FQHC, that's the acronym, acronym you need five essential elements. You need to be located in a high need area, you need to provide comprehensive health and wraparound services, including enabling services, which I'll talk about in a second. You have to be open to all residents, regardless of insurance or ability to pay. A sliding fee scale is used to um, help patients afford the health care at the health center. Um, nonprofits governed by community boards. So um, a health center's board has to be made up at least 51% of members of the community so that the health center is responsive to what the community needs. And then there are performance and accountability requirements. Um, HRSA is the federal agency that governs the health center program. Uh, so today, community health centers serve more than 30 million patients a year. That's almost one in 10 now, the people in the US. Um, there are over 14,000 uh, health center physical locations and over 1,400 health centers. Each health center is an independent nonprofit healthcare organization. Um, we serve a lot of special populations, uh, 1.3 million homeless uh, people, uh, 8.6 million children. Uh, one in five un uh, of our patients are uninsured. One in five are rural, and there are health centers called frontier health centers, which are in areas in which uh, there's a really small number of people per 100 square miles, but many health centers are also located in rural, um, regular rural locations. And one in three people living in poverty, um, health centers provide sort of the comprehensive service I mentioned early, earlier. So um, all sorts of primary care functions, including family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, and obstetrics and gynecology. Um, health centers provide labs to patients using um, funding from the health center program. And so patients who can't otherwise access lab services can access them at the health center. Many health centers provide dental services and have pharmacies. The 340B program helps to support patients who don't have insurance coverage and can't afford out-of-pocket expenses. Um, and we also do case management. I wanted to call out enabling services. So enabling services are basically social interventions so um, things that help people access care that is a barrier to them. Otherwise, that includes things like transportation, health education. Many health centers now have food pantries. Um, they work with the city to set up housing programs. Some health centers even provide transitional housing. So um, all sorts of services that you know the typical health organization is traditionally not engaged in. And those services at health centers have been around for the entire 58 years of the program. So we are not new to social needs and SDOH. 
Um, there are about 100,000 now medical professionals who work in health centers, but we also have lots of behavioral and dental health uh, service professionals as well. And I think at the bottom of the slide, it said 127 million patient visits. Um, so I wanted to switch a little bit to talking about how data uh, relates to health centers. So all of you know that health informatics ultimately drives value-based care. The graphic on the right side of the screen is NAC's value transformation framework. So we have a quality center and the quality center along with our value-based care programs helps to promote health center focused care delivery infrastructure and people services that people extend to care teams and patients. Um, in order to do value-based care at scale, uh, this is not limited to community health centers, of course, we need comprehensive and interoperable data, real-time use of quality measures and clinical decision support. That's some of the slog we've been uh, working through as that Marjorie uh, alluded to when she introduced me. Um, Data-driven care led by a multidisciplinary team uh, and individuals individualized and patient-centered medical care, and of course, the enabling services and everywhere the patient requires access. Many health centers uh, will go to where their patients are. There are special health centers which are school-based, located in public housing, and those that do mobile care. So they go out and see patients on the street, either in a van or just walking up to an encampment. They also work heavily with substance use centers. Um, so I'm going to talk about the importance of structured data to drive healthcare. And there is a disparity in the uh, access and quality of data available to health centers. And that's often because of a uh, lack of resources to support uh, a more sophisticated data infrastructure, lack of staff that um, can help support technology and data, and um, sort of the challenges with EHR vendors who often put community health centers last on their priority list. Um, so I don't need to talk about HTI-1 because uh, Mickey has talked about it and some of the other speakers have talked about it. Um, but it is important to us to continue to push on the ONC Health IT Certification Program to ensure that vendors are providing high quality functionality and data to our, uh, to our health center partners. Um, and Health centers are often finding that there is information blocking happening uh, out in the field, uh, but traditionally have not uh, been very comfortable reporting that because they're concerned about what that does with the relationship to their vendor. So it has been several years since updates to the certification program, significant ones. We obviously have continued to raise the bar on standards and content. Um, but I'll argue that the existing paradigm for certification testing does not ensure real system support functional interoperability. And this is one of the challenges that our health centers find, despite the fact that the product that they use is certified and theoretically supports structured terminologies like WOINC and ARCS norm, um, they are unable to extract data in those terminologies. I'm going to show you some examples in a moment. And what we would like to see is that real-time bi-directional testing of deployed instances of uh, vendor products would be the gold standard in the future. So many of you are all already familiar with current EHR architecture, which uses proprietary database schemas and models, and um, oftentimes a closed source terminology. And we struggle with um, extracting that data and then mapping it because those uh, data dictionaries and EHRs are also proprietary. So we can't exactly download the, the, um, the data dictionary and do our own mappings. Um, you know, sharing data as a result is very difficult and sharing executable software is also very infeasible. So we've built a fire implementation guide that helps to support uh, health centers and anyone who wants to use it in uh, identifying patients who have not had uh, evidence-based HIV testing and offers them that test if it has not been done on the appropriate time frame, Then for patients who have an increased risk as evidenced by the data already available in the EHR, it suggests that we offer that patient um, HIV prevention, such as PEP and PrEP. However, we have struggled mightily to implement that, despite the fact that all of our vendor partners should have a fire API ready and willing 
to interact with that software. And um, when we uh, got health center partners, very sophisticated ones, and asked them, can you implement our Fire IG in your system? They said, well, if you actually want this done, we just need to hand code it. So that's not where we want to be in terms of being able to create the content that not only health centers, but um, all of the industry needs to be able to support different kinds of patients. Uh, we, we cannot expect the vendors to um, give us decision support on things like juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, specific kinds of cancers. There's too much content there. And really, as a, as a primary care provider myself, I work in a health center in Northern Virginia about eight hours a week. Um, I know that I want actually people like me to be creating the stuff that I'm going to use. I don't, I don't really want to rely on the vendor. But if I can't have someone who knows as a subject matter expert in this place and understands the workflow to build it and then plug it in, I'm still stuck at the same place that I'm stuck at now. Uh, I'm going to show some more examples, as I said, of data extraction challenges, but many of our partners spend, you know, weeks trying to create um, uh, a data extract. Uh, many health centers use a third-party population health tool, but even some of those tools aren't able to be flexible and customized. So they actually have to go back to their population health vendor to create queries. And that process, I can tell you, has taken us um, months working with the, one of the population health vendors during COVID. It took them over six months to be able to generate an extract on COVID patients. Um, <clears throat> And software costs are higher. So many of the community health centers say, well, the vendor actually does have something, but we have to pay a whole lot more to get it. And that is not in our budget. Um, recently, one of the health center CEOs told us, you know, the number one cost in my budget other than staff is the EHR. It's the most expensive thing at the health center. And you can imagine in a low resource organization, that is a real squeeze and it takes away resources that otherwise would go to patients. Um, so we also uh, have been working with health centers to help them understand that low quality data is not going to go away on its own, right? We have to actually build a whole team and skill set to start looking at our data and finding where the bad data quality is and eliminating that through changes to the workflow and, and the system and the process. Missing data is highly prevalent when we talk about SDOH. That's an area where you, you might ask for an extract and only find the data is there for 10% of the patients. But actually, the health center says, no, no, we, we screen almost everyone. It's just not coming out in the extracts. And that may be because the data is unstructured or it's getting captured in free text. But we can't use that data to inform care unless we can get it into a structured form and, and extract it and use it. Um, I, I sure, surely don't have to tell everyone that lack of harmonization um, in the different sectors, including and particularly mentioning public health, is a real challenge. Um, we strongly agree with the OMC that um, all of the different federal agencies and all the different public health agencies really do need to move all of their programs to using interoperability standards in order to make it feasible for health centers to both send and also receive data. One of the challenges at health centers is they send a lot of data out, but they don't get a lot of data in. And sometimes that's because of a uh, lack of awareness. For example, my health center uh, got connected to our state IIS because the vendor ran into me at a, an industry meeting and said, did you say you don't have a feed from IIS? Are you in Virginia? We have that. And literally an email got that turned on in a week. So also, you know, working to educate the community about um, things that might be available, ways to sort of um, ensure that the right mapping is done in um, our EHR, the clinical decision support doesn't work. And it's not because there isn't clinical decision support, it's because no one has done the mapping. And one of the challenges we have though is a health center is not gonna hire a terminologist, right? So it's unclear to me why vendors try to put that task into the hands of people who would not be qualified to, to uh, take it on. Um, so hopefully working with terminology partners, such as terminology vendors, will be helpful in helping to move health centers forward. But I do want to stress that that is not a feature that is just handed to every customer. 
Um, the other thing that's pretty surprising is how um, call centers often aren't using very much dashboarding. And um, that is also a functionality which may or may not be available to them, but often requires a great deal of customization and maintenance to make achievable. Um, we had a call during the pandemic with a health center and all of the clinical people are there with their masks on the Zoom call. And then their data analyst is several uh, states away on his Zoom window. He's talking about the data extract that he sent to NAP because we're doing a CDC project about surveillance during the pandemic. And the clinical team goes, hey, you, data guy, why are you giving any of this data to us? And he goes, oh, what data do you want? So we have to create those connections between um, the technology, terminology, data folks, and the clinical teams to ensure that there's you know, accountability and responsiveness to the needs of the team, and really focus on making sure that we're providing feedback to the care teams. So despite the fact that we have terminology uh, and uh, interoperability standards, many organizations are still doing this, which is anytime they want a point-to-point -point data connection, they have to create a customized mapping in order to achieve that. <laughs> and so you can imagine how many potential interfaces would benefit a healthcare organization. And yet there is you know, a real barrier to getting all of those data sources to be available in the interface and in the local system. And that's because of this barrier with the mapping. So I'm gonna show you a few examples. These are actually real data that came out of um, health centers. Uh, and were sent to NAC for uh, various public health and quality improvement surveillance projects. So unclear to me why the hash is in front of these meds. This is a vendor who was sending us meds that appeared to be largely free texted and had no Rx norm codes attached to them. So what does our team do? Well, we have to go in and map every line of all of these spreadsheets. The numbers are the number of instances of that data element being used. You can imagine that when there's one or two uh, actual pieces of data mapping that is pretty low value, and yet that's the only choice we have if we want to integrate that data into the data set. We asked them to send us uh, only contraceptives and birth control, but some things snuck in there. This is a, a hormone replacement therapy, but we also found a number of albuterol inhalers in this list for a reason we could not figure out. This is from the COVID project. Um, so we asked people to extract with, we, we gave them actually a list of the LOINC codes for the lab tests. But what we ended up getting was a mishmash of proprietary lab codes and LOINC codes. So we used Google to try and figure out, well, what are these proprietary codes actually supposed to be lab wise? Um, probably not the best way of doing terminology work. This was a list of examples of things that we mapped to be determined negative. Um, I, my personal favorite is negative. Um, but as you can see, you know, the, the possible answers should be negative, positive, and indeterminate. We found a huge number of, of vari variations on all three of those things in the data set. This was all, all of these data were also in the result field for the lab test. I highlighted the bottom one because it's very obviously a piece of PHI, someone's date of birth. But all of these things are not lab results, they're something else. So unclear how these things are getting into our structured data, but it's happening. So, you know, common data elements are a foundation that supports all types of data needs. And uh, it's really important uh, to me that I you know, educate health centers on thinking about using uh, a single piece of data for all of these purposes. And when we create common data elements and align them to all these different use cases, we actually can do a great deal to improve the experience, improve the care coordination, provide better decision support, and that feedback, those analytics that the, the care teams really want. Um, I think that my fire slides disappeared here, so hopefully I won't be fired from the board of HL7. But I do want to call out FIRE, Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources, as the foundation that, um, that we're hoping to use with health centers moving forward. Despite the fact that uh, December 31st, 2022, 
was the required date for vendors to deploy a fire API to health centers. You know, many health centers still do not have a fire API that's conformant to the requirements. And one of the projects that NAC is uh, getting started on right now is actually, can we create a directory of health center fire endpoints to help support interoperability and demonstrate that we're able to work with payers and um, HIEs and QINs to actually leverage that to exchange data where data exchange is not happening. Um, many health center uh, CMIO types have told me that not having claims data is such a huge um, burden on them because their data is by definition de by definition incomplete. And when we're talking about things like calculating a breast cancer screening quality measure and getting mammogram structured data into the system, there is a gap like this big in between structured mammogram information and the quality measure and what the payer has. If we're able to pull that payer data in, the score goes from here to here, even though no additional care has been provided. Um, another thing that we've been implementing in our NAC data warehouse is the Odyssey model. Um, we like working with the Odyssey model because it has a robust community around it and there are a bunch of open source tools. So when we're working with low resource organizations, open source is um, excellent. And that's one of the reasons we also love FHIR and are building tools in FHIR. Um, the back end of our uh, AWS data warehouse, where we store limited data sets and uh, de-identify data from health centers to do those quality improvement and surveillance projects I mentioned, both supports FHIR and the OMOP model, which is owned by Odyssey, and there's a slide about the OMOP common data model. Um, we're actually working right now to figure out how we can um, expose the community health data model as mapped in our back end to anyone who would like to share it and, and use it. Um, most of the data that we have done, you know, heavy mapping and cleaning work on is related to our projects, but our projects sort of span the, the spectrum of COVID and pediatric and family weight and uh, postpartum care and adult immunizations and cardiovascular disease. So it's already a really big resource and we want to share it with everyone. Um, one of the challenges though that we have with the health centers is them understanding the concept of the data flow. So we do a lot of work trying to help um, health centers not only look at the data, extract it, but go backwards and say, well, how did this data get generated? Are we asking people to do things that make no sense? If we're not using the data. Why are we taking away from clinical care time to have people do data entry? So I just wanted to close with some of the best practices for CDEs. So um, I consider the Community Health uh, Data Dictionary that we've created a, a set of CDEs. And um, you know we're focused on elements that meet the community health needs. So um, as I mentioned, that HIV work, um, focusing on understanding risk factors for HIV, understanding how um, health centers implement HIV prevention programs, um, looking at opportunities for harmonization and reuse. Um, I know that we have a number of times talked to quality measure owners and um, federal agencies about that lack of harmonization. We'll encourage you also to raise your voice when you're seeing that. Um, and uh, again, aligning with the other use cases is really important. One of the things that, uh, you know, one of our health centers did was they really wanted to implement a better workflow for contraceptive counseling, because we find that um, tons of conversations are happening out in the field between care providers and patients about contraception. But again, there's usually no record of that in the EHR unless uh, something's actually prescribed to the patient. And when this health center um, took on the activity of remaking their workflow so that they started with what's the pregnancy intention of the patient and captured that in a structured way and what um, counseling was provided and capturing that in a structured way, they actually doubled their revenue in the um, area of contraceptive counseling because they instituted that systematic workflow. So thinking about how we align things like uh, payment codes and structured data together is really important. So I'm gonna move to talk a little bit about um, SDOH, social drivers of health, also sometimes known as social determinants of health. 
Um, so we do know that USCDI has increasingly been including some SDOH content. Um, it's pretty loosey-goosey as to what uh, you use in each category to describe SDOH. Um, personally, I don't fully understand why we separately are calling out SDOH goals from patient goals and SDOH assessment from assessment, because in the health center space, uh, social needs and health, other health concerns, medical conditions, et cetera, are equivalent. We don't treat one as more important than the other or as separate than the other. Um, but we are excited to, to see uh, an HTI-1, for example, the proposal to use some specific link codes to, for specific SDOH data elements. We think that's very much needed. Um, we've done a significant amount of work in cleaning up the SDOH data model at NAC and are hoping that we'll be able to share our formal model uh, as we're uh, releasing the Community Health Center Dictionary. Um, SDOH is really important for value-based care, and many health centers are doing value-based care arrangements that include social drivers of health in the payment model or in the response model. Um, we are working with a health center network in California, for example. Um, when they sent us their COVID data in the pandemic, we said, wow, how, how do you have 95% data capture on like a bunch of these SDOH domains? And they said, oh, we have a payer arrangement where they ask us to capture that data. So those are ways that we can actually drive better data completeness and, and better attention to that data. And they actually got over a million dollars a year for the last couple of years by identifying their patients who had housing insecurity and creating a program to wrap around them. And that caused all of their health outcomes to improve. And then they got those incentive payments. Uh, but you really do have to align the way that you do the work if you're actually gonna benefit from those arrangements. Um, so I say that food insecurity, housing in insecurity and transportation barriers are sort of the big three in health center patients. Um, obviously, there are other important SDOH uh, items, including income, which I mentioned, I think, I don't think I did mention. So 90 plus percent of health center patients are actually at 200 percent of the federal poverty level or less. Um, so income is a, a factor for almost all health center patients. Um, but it, while we ask about these big three, and there's really a ton of excitement about gathering SDOH data, um, my concern is that we are not getting as excited about meeting people's needs. And there is a moral injury both to patients and to care team members to have a conversation where you say, do you have enough to eat? And the patient says no, and that's the end of that conversation. If we don't respond in real time to social needs, we're really doing a disservice, both to the care team and to the patient. And we've gotten this feedback from a lot of people who work at health centers saying, if I have nothing to offer the patient, I almost don't wanna ask these questions. So I think one of the things I'm here to impress upon you today is we can't get excited about SDOH data capture unless we're also excited about um, social intervention data capture. And that is a big gap right now for the industry, I think. Um, but the SDOH data, as I said, can be used to help identify those patients who have a lot of needs and then respond appropriately if we set those, um, if we set those things in place. Um, health centers, as I mentioned, work also with a lot of patients who have mental health needs and substance use disorder. And so I think thinking broadly about what is SDOH is also important because um, substance use can be a huge barrier to actually adherence to care. And um, so we, we really need to think about what are all those components. There are actually a large number of health centers that have programs where they either provide care or they act as a bridge for patients who are coming out of incarceration because there are really bad outcomes that happen for patients as they go into incarceration and come out because of that lack of coordination. And we do work with a lot of veterans and military service members. I remember people kept coming to me from TRICARE and I was like, why do you keep coming here? And they're like, oh, they, they tell us to come here. Like, okay. All right, managing the problem list. So uh, in the inpatient care setting, and I'm, many of you may know this, but you know, indulge me. In the inpatient care setting, there's an active act of managing the problem list that happens when the patient is admitted, you do reconciliation of that problem list. 
In the outpatient setting, there is not really the same workflow. So one of the challenges we have is we're trying to identify uh, patients with specific health conditions that we're trying to respond to is actually, is that problem list accurate? Some patients will have you know, very little on their problem list. Some patients will have 20, 30 things um, of which some things might be strep throat or in bone toenail. And so I would argue that uh, we are moving forward the health industry needs to create an activity of outpatient problem reconciliation because those big, messy uh, problem lists are problematic. But we would like to see on that problem list health concerns such as social drivers of health. Um, patients who have had a history of a social driver of health are significantly more likely to have that problem again in the future. And so continuing to do more frequent screening for them is probably going to benefit them and get them uh, get their needs met sooner. Um, so I have a terminologist who was trained by Clem McDonald on my team. His name is Raymond Uwe. And he has basically been going around the country at the request of health centers doing an educational program about using ICD-10 codes to track social drivers of health. Uh, why is that useful, given that no one really pays for ICD-10 codes for social drivers of health? Well. Um, if you're a health center, the easiest thing you can extract from your EHR is a billing code. So even if you're not getting paid for that activity, you can now use that as a marker to identify patients who have social needs. This is a list of, of um, ICD-10 codes that are in use. And we know that actually the terminology has been including a lot of new concepts. We have heard of some value-based care uh, programs that are starting to use the Z codes as part of the um, way that they're tracking and working with SDOH. And uh, I, I'm going to be speaking actually to the uh, Washington DC PCA soon about this topic um, because they have you know, had increasing success in working with the individual health organizations to have mapping be part of the workflow and have to have that coding there. These are just a couple of slides about how to use Z codes from CMS. They actually have a guide out on it. Um, and if you have a health organization which is not doing this, then you might uh, you know, point them in that direction because it is, it is a potentially useful way at the, the current point in time to be tracking some of that. Um, so this is actually a graphic from uh, the PREPARE materials. And I wanted to talk for a minute about PREPARE. Uh, so PREPARE is a standardized patient risk assessment protocol um, it's currently implemented, I think, in pretty much every vendor that's out there. And the goal is to engage patients in assessing and addressing social determinants of health. And um, as you can see from the graphic, it's not just about assessing, it's about responding. Um, so this is the first version of PREPARE, the one that's been out for a decade or so. Um, these are the PREPARE core domains. Um, and most health centers also use the optional domains to understand about uh, physical safety, domestic violence, refugee status, and incarceration history. There are a lot of refugee programs in health centers, and, and many people who are refugees are referred to health centers by social service agencies. Prepare is actually currently in the, um, in the process of being updated, adding a number of uh, new areas. If you're interested in Prepare, please let me know. Um, and the idea of the prepared domains is that not only do they work at the patient level, but that they also roll up to the community level, and then we can use those, those data to um, advocate for community uh, and uh, state and national policies and programs to support SDOH. Um, at HIMSS last year, I presented uh, with Joy Dahl, who's from Sync Health, which is one of our partners at HAE in Nebraska. They cover a little bit of Oklahoma and, and Iowa now, too. Um, and she told the story that, you know, they were trying really hard working with their health centers to get data on housing and security. And they set up a meeting with the, the community public health agencies and social service agencies. And she looked at the data and she's like, oh my gosh, we have so little data. It's like under 10%. Um, you know, we only found 60 some cases of people with housing insecurity here. Like, they're, they're not going to care about this at all. But interestingly, you know, not only did they sort of use that data to extrapolate the number of patients who probably had the same need but were representative of the larger population, 
but that meeting led directly to a new housing program in that area. So even a small amount of data can have a pretty big impact, and I encourage you all to start and recognize the limitations of your data, but also to give that feedback. Don't wait to give that feedback to the partners who may be able to take action to help. Um, so as I mentioned, social interventions is, you know, our current primary uh, focus on the data side because uh, we really think it's important to understand um, how are we serving patients? And if we want to know about the success of these interventions, we actually need to measure them. So um, we can use that data then to create dashboards. Let's say here's a list of our patients with this social need, and here's the action that we have taken for each one. And if we did a referral, for example, have we closed that loop, yes or no? So social interventions are currently generally not reimbursed, although I mentioned that value-based care arrangement, which is an obvious exception, um, but still so critically important um, to my point about moral injury and also about um, if we don't address the social need, are we going to expect patient outcomes to improve? I, I think not. And I think those, those social service programs also will really benefit from that data because they can give real feedback to uh, their funders and their resourcing about you know, how much need is still unmet. Um, we do work with the Gravity Project. I'm on the executive committee and several of my team members serve on the other Gravity committees. Um, our SDOH data model includes mapping of all the Gravity value sets which are available in VSAC and also in FIRE. And um, as many of you know, Link and SNOMED are the, the core of those uh, data, that data model. I just called out a couple emerging quality measures because we expect that we'll be seeing um, we'll be seeing a movement to require healthcare organizations to be doing this kind of uh, work in the future. So CMS proposed these in the IPPS 2023 final rule. And also there's ongoing work at NCQA to create and extend measures under HEDIS programs. Um, actually, health centers are have their own quality reporting program, which is called the Uniform Data System. And that has been asking for SDOH data for some time now. Um, UDS is actually in the process of modernization and a partnership between HRSA and ONC. And in the future, um, health centers will have to report patient level data using bulk fire on the UDS domains, which include a number of clinical quality measures in addition to SDOH. Okay. Uh, so we know that systematic systemic variability leads to lack of standardization and usability of SDOH data. So again, following that path as the data trickles down and going back to the source, to improve SDOH data is equally as important as improving and filling in things like the mammograms and the hypertension scores and things like that. And while there is growing consensus about the right approach, because of the complexity of the health IT ecosystem, uh, it's still hard to ensure that each one of these places and spaces are doing the same thing at the same time. So for my last couple of minutes, I just wanted to talk a little bit about some health equity challenges, it's actually health IT equity challenges that we have been experiencing in our work in women's health. So I probably should have put a slide here that talked about the maternal mortality uh, health disparities crisis in the United States, although um, probably many of you are well aware that we um, in the U.S. have the worst uh, maternal and infant outcomes in the developed world, and that Black women are four times more likely to experience maternal mortality than white women, that um, disparity is less but still exists in other racial and ethnic categories. And uh, all of the massive fountain of data that we have has not had a huge impact on that problem. In fact, it has been getting worse and not better as we um, move to electronic health records. So I'm gonna make an argument that there are a few reasons for that. So we have a large project. We have over 100,000 deliveries in our data set that comes from several large community health networks. So 
Um, FGHCs have what are called health center controlled networks as also part of the HRSA program. The health center controlled network kind of serves an HIE function in that they help to aggregate data across multiple health centers. So at a minimum, usually that means they have some kind of data warehouse population health tool or storage location. There's an, a different flavor of HCCN where they actually host an EHR instance and provide that as a service to health centers. So you can imagine the data quality out of a network that's hosted is much better than one that um, uses different health centers with different EHR products. Um, so this project, we worked with two large, uh, three large health center controlled networks that um, we're hosting, although sometimes those networks will have people on other products that they're bringing in or, or moving off. Um, over 100,000 deliveries. And I think the first time we did a data analysis in 2020, we had uh, fewer than 50% of the pregnancies in that data set had a, a delivery date, the day that the baby was born. The focus of the project was postpartum care. So we're looking a year after the baby was born, still less than half of the time, no delivery date. Why is that? Well, the delivery happens in the hospital generally. The hospital may or may not send any information to the health center, but structured delivery date is pretty much not one of those things usually. Oftentimes people will get like a PDF fax, something of that nature sent if they get anything at all. And so what we found was, well, it's gonna be really hard to calculate whether or not postpartum care was delivered in a timely fashion if we don't know the time, the day that the baby was born. So our partners have actually been working on this and they've gotten their data completeness up to, I think, close to 70% over the last couple of years. But I mean, think about it. So 51%, I think is 51 or 53% uh, of maternal deaths actually happen between a week after the birth and a year. So we don't have that data a year later. Um, we can make some assumptions about our ability to help support those patients and prevent morbidity and mortality in that important period. Um, pregnancy status data element also is a challenge. Status is a point in time, and we want to think about the pregnancy over its entirety. So seeing one instance of a pregnancy status element is confusing and not really sure what to do with that. Pregnancy outcome is not a structured thing in general, although uh, the CDC has uh, a value set for pregnancy outcomes. It's not implemented in the industry. Um, I talked about some of our contraceptive counseling. So one of the quality measures in the postpartum space is contraceptive counseling. That is very challenging to capture unless you've done some of that work to make sure you're implementing that consistently. Also, contraceptive counseling can happen before the baby is born. So when do you look for it in the record is, is its own challenge. Um, and then, you know, the privacy and security of reproductive health data is also an ongoing and increasing concern, given that there are a number of new legal policies about um, reproductive data and potential penalties, uh, mostly for providers, but also for people who uh, know the patient and have no information about a pregnant patient in regards to the outcome of that pregnancy. I, I won't go there because I've got too much. Okay, pregnancy status. So that was proposed by ONC and was accepted in uh, version three. NAC submitted it every year, by the way. <laughs> um, but actually no code was listed in the published USCBI version three. I think we will hopefully see that change. This is the LOINC code that um, is sort of the industry standard. And uh, use of pregnancy status is not really super feasible though, because you actually have to reconcile the data element. So one of the, the interesting pieces of feedback and one of the things that's helped the contraceptive project about figuring out what the actual delivery date is, is that, um, do I have this next? Yeah, so one of our partners has a vendor who implemented a pregnancy episode data model. So the pregnancy episode says, this is when I found out when the patient was pregnant. It tries to group all of the data about the pregnancy into an episode. And then it says, 
Well, it's been 50 weeks since we thought you got pregnant. You probably aren't pregnant anymore. Let's create a flag in the record to close out the pregnancy episode. And so that's an opportunity to fill in that missing data. And actually the partner who told our other partner about that, they said, oh, that's a great idea. So they spent the last couple of years implementing the pregnancy episode into their EHR. And this is what I'm going to argue we need for uh, equity in health IT data for pregnancy is we don't just need the pregnancy status because that's just a point in time kind of flag. What we need is all of the relevant information about the pregnancy to support the care team, to support the patient, to support the outcomes. So we need delivery date. We need the estimated date of confinement or, or delivery. We need gestational age. And I mentioned gestational age with a little asterisk because thanks to its inclusion in quality measure by the Joint Commission several years ago, EHRs are more likely to support that than any of these other things. Um, and we need to know gravity, parity, multiple births, and, and critically, the pregnancy outcomes. So we have continued to submit these to ONC on a regular basis. And um, what we're working on is building a, a model that we can use in FIRE and, and other places that would support all of these data elements continuously over the course of a pregnancy and after. Um, and so here's a smattering of the codes that we've proposed um, to include in this data model. And as I said, um, it's critical both to support the patient during the pregnancy and also in the postpartum period. The, the One of the other things I'll mention is um, one of the things that one of our partners has been working on is maternal fetal record linkage. So not only would we like to know information about the pregnancy, but we'd like there to be interoperability where we can get some information about the pregnancy as it relates to the baby and vice versa. Um, but women's health IT equity extends beyond the pregnancy. So uh, gender identity is a, a big focus on has for a long time been structured data in community health center records. Um, however, gender identity can be fluid in some individuals. And one of the things that's critically important from a quality standpoint is to know what organs does the patient have. If we're going to do cervical cancer screening, we need to know who has a cervix, for example. Uh, if we're going to do breast cancer screening, we need to know who's breast tissue. So the organ inventory approach is increasingly becoming a way of capturing that data and a way of tracking uh, those patients. I will call out one more thing that um, gets my goat, which is that um, ONC has required the unique device identifier to be transmitted in transitions of care for several years. It's 2015 edition, I believe. However, for some interesting reason, the most common implanted devices in the United States IUDs and contraceptive implants are not subject to that requirement. I would encourage LNC to close that loophole. Um, and then, you know, we have ongoing challenges with quality measures, not supporting patient preferences, lack of alignment across programs. And I'm going to end here, which is um, my hope for a wonderful future of common data elements powered by structured terminology and fast healthcare interoperability resources. Any questions? Preparing a uh, epidemiologic database for the state, for the region, and we're very interested in community health center data um, um, and participation in that. Um, what is the business model for IT support in community health centers across the United States. I mean, a lot of the problems that you identify are very foundational um, in the way that, you know, the centers are organized and they manage their data. And I was just wondering how, how do they fund a, an electronic health record even? I mean, I realize they're required to have one, mm -hmm. but there's all kinds of solutions to that. Yeah, there are a number of different approaches. Uh, there are health centers that actually sort of um, jump on to an instance that's locally hosted by like a larger uh, health system, such as, you know, the local hospital. The challenge with that approach is that the health center requirements and needs never get met, basically. Actually, I found out that our health center um, had that offer repeatedly from the health system that we work most closely with and has refused every time because of some concerns about that. But 
Um, many health centers uh, have to write that line into their budget. Intermittently, HRSA provides uh, additional funds to do things like upgrades, but it's really not commensurate with the level of uh, the activity. I think what I'm hoping is that as people are moving to value-based care, they um, you know find ways creatively. Health centers always are have to be creative with how they resource things because they have a quarter of the the resources. Um, but that they find ways to work with payers, to work with other partners, to build that staff locally, so that they can do that work. And you know, even in the richest health system in the world, like that work is never done, right? It's just continuously. You have to know how to do it. You need to keep maintaining all of, you know, your data follow-up and you need to keep maintaining your data quality. Secondly, if I may ask, um, you mentioned the OMOP uh, data model and the Odyssey network. That, uh, from what you described, would be a big step forward, um, you know, towards um, interoperation of your healthcare data. Um, what's the penetration of that into community health centers across the U.S.? Yeah, so we know a couple of our large networks are already mapped to OMA. And I know that in some of the public health use cases that there is increasing interest and knowledge of uh, the OMOP model and some movement towards doing that. I think OMOP is basically the exact opposite of a proprietary data dictionary. So uh, definitely, I think when as soon as people understand sort of what it, it offers, they see the value in that. And I know that some of the research networks are also looking at, um, you know, taking in OMOP data through APIs. Uh, so that will allow, you know, sometimes that can actually be resourcing on its own. You participate in some activity where they, you know, provide you resources for the value of your data. But in general, health centers don't really like to sell their data. They're not super comfortable with that. One more quick question. Thank you. I'm uh, mentioning pregnancy and birth and children. Uh, maybe you could join us uh, because we are working on a fire implementation guide on international birth and child health. And please join us. We need support for, from anyone who wants to join us. Not only that we want to have, we, the main thing is we want to have the data from the fetus to the child health record. Journal fetal record linkage, we're there. Invite us. I'll give my card. Anything else? Thank you so much. So thank you, Dr. Skapik. May I call you Julia?